The years between Tolkien's World War I experience and the publication of The Hobbit may at first glance seem less important than the other eras of his life. However, it was during this period that Tolkien established himself as a highly regarded philologist, befriended C.S. Lewis, and undertook a focused development of the Middle-earth legendarium. Join us as we continue our exploration of the life of J.R.R. Tolkien. The Tolkien Road, Episode 220, The Life of J.R.R. Tolkien, Part 2. Hello everyone, welcome to The Tolkien Road, Episode 220, The Life of J.R.R. Tolkien, Part 2. Greta, hey. what's up? Hey, um, not a whole lot. How are you doing? I'm doing quite well. Wonderful. Fine winter's, not quite winter's afternoon. Not quite winter's afternoon. Is it? Oh yeah, I guess it's not winter yet, is it? No. Even though we got snow last week. Or was we that did. earlier this week? I can't remember. I think that, it was earlier this week. It was It was earlier this week, in yeah. fact. Yeah. yeah. It, was, uh, it was Monday morning, so. Yeah. So that kind of made it feel like winter. A veritable winter's wonderland. Yes. It was. It was. For all of a couple of hours. <laughs> Indeed. On this episode, we are continuing our discussion of Tolkien's life. We'll be looking specifically at the years after World War I and before the publication of The Hobbit, when he became a father of four, embarked on a renowned academic career, began an important friendship with C.S. Lewis, and started serious work on the legendarium of Middle-earth. Hmm. That's a lot. It sound like an episode to you? It sounds it sounds like a pretty fantastic episode, if you ask me. You better believe it. I know it. Yes. Before we get started, we'd like to give a shout out to our patrons. Special thanks to this episode's executive producer, Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Yes, and thank you. And thank you to all of our patrons. You too can become a patron. Head on over to patreon.com slash Tolkien Road and show off your super fandom. Oh. Show off your super fandom I over like there. I like that. So, I like that little tagline. Yeah, yeah. It's good. Yeah, you know, early on in the day, uh, you know, I think to uh, Caitlin, in fact, I think was one of our early super fans, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and so I'm bringing back that whole, whole nomenclature. No notion of super fans. Yeah. Yep. Just, cool, cool. You know, I think it sounds cool. It does sound. It sounds Cause, cool, cool, cool. Because the super fans are super. They are. Yeah. If you're unable to support us via Patreon, you can also support us by heading over to whatever episodes you happen to be listening to and clicking the blue leave a tip button and just expressing your gratitude by dropping dropping a million bucks our way over there. So <laughs> Or just a few bucks is fine. Oh, that's right. Mm -hmm. A few bucks is fine. Every little bit is very however, much however, appreciated. However it is that you need to build up to a million bucks. <laughs> you know, understand. Okay. You know Got it. and understand you can't maybe do it all at once, but you know. Right on. Right on. Yep, right on. Also, you must, that you are hereby ordered to subscribe, rate, and review us on iTunes and other podcasting platforms. Please leave us a five-star rating and say some nice things about us. Leaving five stars and a review helps get the word out about us, so please, if nothing else, head on over and leave us five stars and tell the world that you love the Tolkien Road and what you love about the Tolkien Road, uh, and because you are hereby ordered to do so. So. Okay. Well, I guess you're just, you know, laying down the gamut. Laying, laying Wait, down the, laying down the, the gamut? Right, that's not the right expression, I have no idea what it? that means. I think, he's, I think he meant it's laying down the, the law. No, laying down. Maybe I didn't mean laying down the law. Laying down the law? There's a gamut, though, right? No, that's gauntlet. Oh, jeez. I'm just going to stop talking. Yeah. Okay. Well, no, you can't stop talking because you're oh. the co-host of the podcast. <laughs> that's true. Well, we why just, don't you take it we just, for the we, next couple... We just have to live with your malapropisms. <laughs> Mal Ooh, so. that's a cool word. Is that an actual word? Yeah, malapropism. What does that mean? Mal, you don't even know what malapropism is. Well, Allow um, me, the, mas the master of English. I was going to say, excuse me for not having a master's John in English. John Carswell, the master of English. A malapropism is the mistaken use of an incorrect word in place of a word with a similar sound, resulting in a nonsensical, sometimes humorous utterance. Oh so that's gosh. actually what you did. That is so perfect. Yeah. A malapropism. Well, I'm just really glad. It, it wouldn't have been a malapropism if you had intended to say laying down the law. Right. It, that would have been something different. I'm not quite sure exactly, specifically, technically what that would have been. Okay. But you meant to say 
uh, laying down the gauntlet, which, and you said Does laying it, down the gamut. Gamut. Right? Oh, yes. So. Yeah. So malapropism. See, I'm really glad that happened because it gave you an opportunity to use that word and I learned something new. Yeah. And maybe our listeners did too. Mm-hmm. So that's fantastic. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Well, moving on. Onward. Yes. Tolkien News. So, uh, well, and the largest news of all <laughs> for the third week running, you can head over <laughs> to YouTube and check out my latest video, Tolkien versus the Nazis, and subscribe to my YouTube channel over there and make sure you get alerts. Um, do it. Mm-hmm. Um, also, just kind of minor thing, Latron Prime has uh, added 20 new cast members. Is that like that's that doesn't sound very minor to me i'm i'm uh being oh, ironic you're being sarcastic being ironic okay. yes okay cool mm. oh the irony so who did they add do we know well they added 20 people mm-hmm. none of whom i know <laughs> none of whom i've ever heard of okay but apparently they've been in things uh let's see i'm looking at uh, lots of people sent me links for this but i'm looking at the collider website uh we got cynthia adai robinson powers comma spartacus power and spartacus uh benjamin walker from heart of the sea peter milan from westworld uh let's see maxime baldry years and years ian blackburn unbreakable bow kip chapman top of the lake anthony crumb the wilds maxine cunliffe power rangers megaforce tristan Grevel from the terror sir lenny henry uh, a famed british comedian from broadchurch uh, Thusitha Jaya Sundera from Don Mar, Fabian McCallum from Yumi and the Apocalypse, Simon Morells from Nightfall, Jeff Morelli from Grassroots, Lloyd Owen from Apollo 18, Augustus Prue from Into the Dark, Peter Tate from The Return of the King. Ooh, we got one from, uh, we got a little Lord of the Rings alumnus there. Yeah. And then uh, Alex, Tar- Alex Tarrant from Filthy Rich, Leon Wadham from Go Girls, and Sara Zwango Bani from Doctor Doctor. All right, we got to see who this Peter Tate is to see if he's somebody. If we can figure out who he might be playing, uh, if if he played, so we don't know who any of these people are playing, right? We so, just know their names, right? We don't know who anybody's who anybody's playing. Let's see. Peter Peter Tate is a New Zealand actor and director who played Shagrat as well as a Corsair of Umbar and the Lord of the Rings: The Return of the King. So he played one of the orcs. He played, oh, okay. yeah, remember okay. one of the orcs from yeah, yeah. the uh, Tower of Kirithungal. Mm-hmm. Um, so he apparently played one of the orcs as well as a corsair of Umbar, which has some kind of that that has some relevancy to Numenor. So I don't know, maybe he'll be playing the same unnamed corsair of Umbar, but mm-hmm. probably not. Okay. That would have been a long time ago. Uh, he probably I don't think he I don't think he, um, I don't think any corsairs of Umbar lived to be three thousand years old. So it's probably not him. But uh, but anyway, he is a Lord of the Rings alumnus, so there's one name for you. But I find that good. So I don't recognize any of these people's names. And, and we to do me, not know what roles they're playing. And we don't know what roles they're okay. playing. And I kind of like that because that way it's not going to be like somebody just falls into the show and is like, here I am, I'm awesome. It's not like Tom Cruise is playing somebody, right? Oh. That would be very weird if Tom Cruise was playing was playing somebody on the show. Um but, you know, yeah. then, then it's not like the big personality just lets it be about... About the story. Middle Earth. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah, I hear you. Yeah. I hear you. So... Plus, I think Tom Cruise only does movies, not series. Well... So, there's that. Well, I didn't want to offer the role to Tom Cruise anyway. Oh. Well, he's probably real busy with Top Gun 2 anyway. I think it's already been made. Oh. But not Top Gun 3. That's right. He's probably busy with Top Gun 3. Top Gun 3. Extra risky (laughs) business. Extra risky business. All right. Uh, So, yeah, that's news. We got some Latron Prime Prime movement. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, This one, though, is very interesting to me. This is um, Project Northmore. So I'm going to dive into this on, uh, I think, next week's episode. We're going to spend a good part of the episode discussing this because I think this is really cool. But you all need to go check this out, projectnorthmore.org. They have a really cool video over there. And what Project Northmore is, this actually works out really well with this episode because uh, 20 Northmore Road is the house that Tolkien and his family lived in from basically 1926 to, I think, like 1947, if I have my dates correct, and in Oxford. And there's a big project underway. There's a big effort underway to basically 
have a charitable fund that buys this house and turns it into basically a Tolkien center, right? A center oh. for Tolkien, Tolkien things, not necessarily a museum, but a center for like, you know, creative, uh, you know, further creative endeavors and that sort of thing. So they launched with a really cool video. They got a, they got a bunch of famous people to, um, to be involved in the creation of this video. And so we'll watch it. We'll, you know, you all should go over to projectnorthmore.org and check it out. But basically you can donate at different levels and, um, you know, and contribute to the buying of this house. And it's no small, uh, no small feat. No, I can imagine. Anyway, I don't want to, I don't want to say too much about it just yet. You guys head on over, check it out if you're interested, and then we'll devote some significant time to it on next week's episode because it's uh it's pretty it's pretty interesting pretty exciting little little thing so cool. All right. and it is not a cheap house i i i'm sure it's not it's like i kind of uh, don't even want to know how much it costs i think it's like four million pounds oh what's the yeah. exchange rate what well it's yeah so I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you over here let's see where is the uh website here we go so according to according to the website it is Whoop, where is it? Is it actually for sale? Donate, here we go. Right now? It is, but they, so I I need to, this is why I want to spend some time researching it, because um, I think they've got some kind of, they worked out some kind of deal with the bro, the real estate broker that they were going to try and do, you know, they were going to give them some time to try and raise money to buy oh, this, okay. instead of just selling it as a normal, oh, wow. you know, putting it on the market as a normal home. Okay. Um, so... Yeah, it is. The goal is six million, six million dollars. Wow. So maybe it was. Yeah, I think it was four million pounds. Anyway, I, let's let's uh, let's talk about okay. this on next week's episode. But okay. y'all need to do yourselves a favor and head on over to projectnorthmore.org. Um, it's Northmore, like M O O R, Project North M O O R dot org, and you can learn all about it over there. And then we'll talk about it a bunch next week and. Uh, and that'll be exciting. It'll be fun. That will be fun. I'm already excited. All right. So, I think that is all the news we have. So, busier news week this week. Stick around for the end of the episode for correspondence. Oh, I'm also going to start a new uh, segment on this week's episode. And this will should turn into a weekly, uh, weekly segment. And this is just going to be the Tolkien quote of the week, where I pick a random quote that I like. And, and I talk about it. Right? I don't, I don't understand why you're just now starting this. I know it's, it's kind of popped into my head. See, when I sit down to plan, do all the planning for these episodes, it's so hard because there's so many, there's so many different topics I want to cover. Mm -hmm. And there's so many like just great little things that I just want to talk about. And so, it's, you know, when you're trying to work it out to be roughly an, you know, an hour ish episode, you feel like you got to have some kind of larger topic that you're that you're diving into, but there's all these little snippets of just like things that Tolkien said, or just beautiful lines from his works that I just really would like to spend time unpacking. And so this, um, you know, this is, I'm going to start doing that Do on it. every episode. Only took me 220 episodes to figure that out. Jeez. So this week's Tolkien quote of the week is from a letter that's from the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. You can find it in the letters of J.R.R. Tolkien. It is from letter 45 to his son, Michael. Michael was now an officer cadet at the Royal Military College in Sandhurst. This is in this is on 9 June 1941. Uh, this is the same letter where he calls uh, Hitler a ruddy little ignoramus. So, you know, cool letter for that reason. <laughs> uh, but, but actually, he says something really beautiful uh, before that. So uh, here goes. Still, you are my flesh and blood and carry on the name. It is something to be the father of a good young soldier. Can't you see why I care so much about you and why all that you do concerns me so closely? Still, let us both take heart of hope and faith. The link between father and son is not only of the perishable flesh. It must have something of eternitas about it. There is a place called heaven where the good here unfinished is completed, and where the stories unwritten and the hopes unfulfilled are continued. We may laugh together yet. Hmm. That's beautiful. Yeah, so I just love that for a number of reasons. Um, you know, he's obviously expressing pride in Michael's service and, mm -hmm. um, you know, in a, in a, in a good cause. And, um, 
you know, and, and I, but I just love what he says about the link between father and son, right? You know, that there is, that even beyond this life, that there is a link between, and, and, and I think we can apply that, you know, I think he'd say that beyond just the father son relationship, you know, father, daughter, mother, child, mm-hmm. um, and, you know, spouses, all, all of those sorts of things. Right. Uh, and just saying, I, I think really all we can say is that what we, what we do here, the good that we have here carries over and is perfected and completed, you know, in the next world, mm-hmm. right. In the next life. Yeah. So, uh, I just thought that was, I, th- I just thought that was particularly beautiful and a, uh, and a hopeful thought and yeah, one sure. I wanted to share with you guys. Yeah. So good choice. Any thoughts on your part? Oh uh, no. I mean, I, I agree. I think it's, uh, yeah, I think it's beautiful. Yeah. I also just like it too, because it, it, again, it hints at a topic that really fascinates me. And that is Tolkien's view, like of, of eschatology mm. of, you know, the end of all things of, of this reality and the new heavens and the new earth. And, you know, and what he says there, the stories unwritten and the hopes unfulfilled are content are continued that the good here unfinished is completed. And like, it's right. That, that reminds me a lot of leaf by niggle as well. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Which of course is, you know, the Tolkien's amazing short story that everybody should read. Mm-hmm. If you're 220 episodes in, you haven't read Leaf by Niggle, I'm kind of like, <laughs> what's going on here? All right. So. Okay. All right. That was, I like that a lot. Great. All yeah. right. All right. Greta, you ready to talk some Tolkien Let's bio? Let's do it. Let's do it. So I want to start off with a picture of Tolkien's personality from Humphrey Carpenter's biography. If you've never read Humphrey Carpenter's biography, you need to do yourself a favor and go pick up a copy. It's a really, it, it is the, I believe it is the official, the authorized, yeah, it is the authorized biography of the creator of Middle Earth. So, you know, he was given access probably unlike anybody else to uh, write this biography. And it really is, you know, as far as I know, considered the gold standard when it comes to biographies of Tolkien. So, uh, but I liked this little picture, right? So we're picking up after Tolkien's really childhood and then his service and World War One, and he's come home from the war and, uh, and, you know, he's, he's kind of transitioning back into something like normal life. And, uh, and he's, you know, so he's in 1918, he would have been 26 years old. Um, and this is just, I just like this picture because it kind of summarizes his personality, you know, maybe throughout the course of the rest of his life. So this is what Humphrey Carpenter wrote. On one level, Tolkien's devotion to Catholicism is explicable solely as a spiritual matter. On another, it was bound up very closely with his love for the mother who had made him a Catholic and who had died, he believed, for her Catholicism. Indeed, one can see his love for her memory as a governing motive throughout his life and writings. Her death made him a pessimist, or rather it made him capable of violent shifts of emotion. Once he had lost her, there was no security, and his natural optimism was balanced by deep uncertainty. Perhaps as a result, he was never moderate. Love, intellectual enthusiasm, distaste, anger, self-doubt, guilt, laughter, each one is, each was in his mind exclusively and in full force when he experienced it, and at that moment no other emotion was permitted to modify it. He was thus a man of extreme contrasts. When in a black mood, he would feel that there was no hope, either for himself or the world. And since this was often the very mood that drove him to record his feelings on paper, his diaries tend to show only the sad side of his nature. But five minutes later, in the company of a friend, he would forget this black gloom and be in the best of humor. Someone so strongly guided by his emotions is unlikely to be a cynic, and Tolkien was never cynical, for he cared too deeply about everything to adopt an intellectual detachment. He could, indeed, hold no opinion half-heartedly, could not be uncommitted about any topic that interested him. This sometimes led to strange attitudes. For example, his gallophobia, itself almost inexplicable, made him angry not only about what he considered to be pernicious influence of French cooking in England, but about the Norman conquest itself, which pained him as much as if it had happened in his lifetime. This strength of emotion was also reflected in his passion for perfection in any kind of written work and in, his, in a, and in his inability to shrug off a domestic disaster philosophically. Again, he cared too much. If he had been a proud man, his strong emotions would probably have made him unbearable, but he was in fact very humble. This is not to say that he was unaware of his own talents, for he had a perfectly accurate idea of what he could do and a firm belief in his ability both as a scholar and a writer. But he did not consider that these talents were particularly important. 
with the result that in later years, fame greatly puzzled him, and he certainly had no personal pride in his own character. Far from it. He took an almost tragic view of himself as a weak man, which was another cause of his deep troughs of pessimism. But there was a different result of his humility, a deep sense of comedy that sprang from his picture of himself as yet another feeble member of the human race. He could laugh at anybody, but most of all at himself, and his complete lack of any sense of dignity could and often did make him behave like a riotous schoolboy. At a New Year's Eve party in the 1930s, he would don an Icelandic sheepskin hearth rug and paint his face white to impersonate a polar bear, or he would dress up as an Anglo-Saxon warrior complete with axe and chase an astonished neighbor down the road. Later in life, he delighted to offer inattentive shopkeepers his false teeth among a handful of change. I have, he once wrote, a very simple sense of humor, which even my appreciative critics find tiresome. Uh, and then just finishes last, last little bit here. A strange and complex man, and this attempt to study his personality has not taught us very much. But as C.S. Lewis makes, uh, makes a character say in one of his novels, I happen to believe that you can't study men. You can only get to know them, which is quite a different thing. Uh, I just really like that little picture, you know, that the carpenter paints of Tolkien's, you know, personality, you know, mm-hmm. the, this of these extremes of emotions, um, the impact that losing both of his parents and especially his mother's death had on him. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I can look back over my own life and I can think to myself, I understand, I do, under, I, you know, I, I have, I don't think I've ever experienced loss of that, of that magnitude. Um, I certainly didn't lose either of my parents as a child, but I do know something about like when something happens to you. I think we all, you know, who have lived any, any length of life have experienced things where it kind of rocks our world and shakes the foundations of our lived, our lived, our lived reality. Right. And that can really throw you out of sorts. Um, I think a lot of ways this year has been that way for me. And, um, just with various things going on in the world. <clears throat> I know when I got out of the Navy uh, years ago, it was a very similar experience. You know, you're kind of transition, and you almost don't even know what's going on, you know, yeah. within yourself. It's yeah. a very, it's a very disconcerting experience. And it seems like Tolkien may have carried that with him for much of his life, you know? Yeah. Um, it's interesting to think about that, but it's just also great to hear like the, the humorous, the comedic side of it all where, you know, he would be like just pouring his, pouring his sorrows out in his diary. And then five minutes later, he's like, you know, cracking jokes with somebody, you know, mm. and, and just being kind of a goofball. So yeah, it's a good balance. Yeah. And to be able to, to, uh, you know, be just to be able to, you know, not just to have that balance, but to also be able to be aware. Like he seemed very self-aware mm-hmm. of, um, you know, of not just himself, but of how, maybe these varying mood varying moods affect others mm-hmm. so he would you know he would he would spend he would save that kind of he, sad times for when he was alone mm-hmm. so that and kind of get it out of his system if you will yeah so that he could you know be merry with his friends well and also so much of when he was alone was when he was writing right right so it's yeah. um you know you think about now that emotional, that emotional balance was one of the things that gave us the world of Middle Earth, right? right. You yeah. Know, the the pessimistic side was was part of what gave us Middle Earth, mm-hmm. you know, um, mm-hmm. and maybe in a large degree. Yeah. So when we left off last time, Tolkien was on injured leave, home from the Western Front, and he was married to Edith. They had been married uh, just. Uh, I lost my year on that, but it, it not not from not for a long time. But they had been married. I think they got married in 1917, if uh, memory serves. Um, go back and listen to the last episode. I always do this to myself. All right, um, and so we're going to be looking this time at the period, kind of at the end of that, leading into the publication of The Hobbit, which happened in 1937. So this was a period that saw him become a father of four and begin a promising academic career. Um, he achieved a reputation as an outstanding philologist. He met C.S. Lewis and they, and they, and the inklings began. And then they, he developed the mythology of Middle Earth in a very determined way. It was something that he had kind of sketched out before, but then he, he, he starts to develop it in a more complete way. Um, let's mention his children, his four children, John, who was born in 1917, Michael, who was born in 1920, Christopher, who was born in 1924, and then Priscilla born in 1929. Um, 
So that is that's the family right there. Um, and Priscilla is still alive. <clears throat> Yes, yes, Priscilla, I believe, is still she, alive. She's the only one. That's right. Okay. Christopher, of course, passed away earlier mm. at the beginning of this year. Mm-hmm. So um, you should go back and listen to our episode on Christopher if yeah. you're not. Yeah. So very important figure that, you know, in the second only to his father in terms of in terms of Middle Earth. Yes. So in, in terms of his import to Middle Earth. Um, academic work. So, you know, that's one area that we most of us probably don't consider Tolkien much in that area but but he really was a very accomplished uh academic and so it's worth mentioning uh it's it's worth talking some about that especially here in in his early years uh, as an academic so really his first job after world war one was actually working for the oxford english dictionary and he focused on the letter w so oh my um, goodness (laughs) so did, so the oxford what do you say oh my goodness i don't know it's just it's just funny to me that he would like that that was his job, like just to focus on one letter and the words that began with that letter. It just gives you an, like it just kind of makes you realize just the the breadth and width of the English language. Yeah, that like that would be someone's sole job is just to focus on the words that began with one letter. Have you ever have you ever like read the Oxford or like looked at the Oxford English Dictionary? No, I haven't. It's it is. It's not like other dictionaries. Like, I mean, it is like other dictionaries, but it's, it's like, I mean, it goes, it's, it's a, it's a super use. Like if you're an academic, especially it's like the king of dictionaries. Okay. It just goes into like all of the roots and like where words came from, you know, like, um, so I remember in the course of, I mean, it's been years now, but in the course of getting my master's in English, we had to, you know, I think. I don't think I did a whole course on the Oxford English Dictionary, but I think maybe as part of my history of the English language course, which was by far my favorite course, um, we we spent some time like learning about the history of the Oxford English Dictionary oh, itself, cool. okay. because it is such a it is such an important book when it comes to the English language and like just understanding and unpacking where different words came from. Hmm. Right. Okay. I didn't realize that that's how much information there was so so somebody could probably literally be focused on the letter w for the one person could probably focus on that for their entire life and wow you know not <laughs> not finish not finish yeah <laughs> that's amazing it, it is it's a very wow. amazing it's a very amazing book um so uh and then shortly after uh, you know after, so he worked at oxford Eng- english dictionary for uh, some in- indeterminate amount of time not not maybe more than a year or two and and then in 1920, he gets his first job as a professor at the University of Leeds. He becomes the youngest professor. And uh, Leeds, I looked it up, Leeds is 40 kilometers northeast of Manchester. So it's kind of in the you know, further north in England. Not not quite to Scotland yet, but further north in England. And he was at Univer- the University of Leeds from 1920 to 1925. And then in 1925, he, he went to uh, Pembroke College at Oxford. And he became a fellow of Pembroke College as the Rawlinson and Bosworth Professor of Anglo-Saxon, a position he held until 1945. And that, and in 1930 was when they began to inhabit 20 North Moor Road. So I had, I was off by a few years. So that's the house that we just talked about. Yes, that they're trying right. to, we're, you know, People us Tolkien to... fans are trying to buy right now and turn right. into a, a Tolkien shrine. Gotcha. And they would live there for 17 years. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Until 1947. Uh, notable academic achievements during this period. So one of the biggest is a translation of Beowulf. The The interesting thing is, while he translated Beowulf, he finished it in 1926. It was kind of a personal project, but he didn't get it published until 2014, right? So it, or it didn't mm. get published until 2014. So he um, he's, of course, kind of known in academic circles for his Beowulf scholarship. And, you know, you can understand how translating the whole you know, the translating that whole poem for himself would have made him an expert Mm -hmm. (laughs) on the poem. Yes. Um, One of these days we'll probably talk about Beowulf, the monsters and the critics, which is this highly acclaimed lecture that he delivered in the thirties. And it's still considered a key milestone in Beowulf scholarship. Um, I, I love that like kind of his key argument in uh, Beowulf, the monsters and the critics is that the right understanding and appreciation of Beowulf has been buried under the weight of previous scholarship um, because that's just the most Tol- Tolkienian thing he could possibly say about it, right? That he's he's basically saying like, every, like when you 
when you go to read this, you just need to shut up and stop, stop with your own thoughts and just appreciate it for what it is, <laughs> you know? And, um, you're thinking too much. Well, you're reading too much into it. And you're, you're reading with too many layers of what other people have said about it over it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And so that was like just that whole philosophy from the very beginning with this podcast, like when we were doing the Silmarillion, I, I've always encouraged people go try to read the Silmar- Silmarillion yourself and only come to us when you feel like you're just not making any progress. Right. Yeah. We're not here to be like, Oh, well I'm not going to read the Silmarillion. I'm just going to listen to this podcast and get the foot, get the Cliff's notes version of it. Right. Yeah. No, 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 no. Like Tolkien is, I, I love that. He was from the very beginning, he was passionate about going directly to the sources and reading the actual work itself and appreciating it for the thing that it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, and I love, there's an illustration again in Carpenter's, uh, Carpenter's biography about when Tolkien would teach Beowulf. Uh, and I love this because it shows his passion for the work. And also it's an image of what he might've been like as a teacher. The most celebrated example of this remembered by everyone who was taught by him was the opening of his series of lectures on Beowulf. He would come silently into the room, fix the audience with his gaze and suddenly begin to a, declaim in a, res, in a resounding voice the opening lines of the poem in the original Anglo-Saxon, commencing with a great cry of what, the first word of this and several other Old English poems, which some undergraduates took to be quiet. It was not so much a recitation as a dramatic performance, an impersonation of an Anglo-Saxon bard in a mead hall, and it impressed generations of students because it brought home to them that Beowulf was not just a set text to be read for the purposes of an examination, but a powerful piece of dramatic poetry. As one former pupil, the writer J.I.M. Stewart, expressed it, he could turn a lecture room into a mead hall in which he was the bard and we were the feasting, listening guests. Another who sat in the audience at these lectures was W.H. Auden, who wrote to Tolkien many years later, I don't think I've ever told you what an unforgettable experience it was for me as an undergraduate hearing you recite Beowulf. The voice was the voice of Gandalf. Oh. Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I just love that image because it, to- it shows that Tolkien wasn't wasn't just walking into these classrooms teaching and being like, today we're going to talk about the third letter in the Anglo-Saxon alphabet, right? You know, think of you know whatever boring college professors you may have or high school teachers you may have ever had right or just the caricatures caricatures of them that we're all familiar with right ben stein from ferris bueller right so ben stein's character from ferris bueller um this you know this just shows off his passion for this work that he wanted to impress upon his students that this was this was once a work that was not no one ever the per the people who wrote this and the people who enjoyed it never said to themselves, boy, this is going to be a really important work academically one of these days. Right. Mm -hmm. There was an immediacy to it. There was, it was, it was heartfelt. It was, it was meant for, uh, for enjoyment. It was meant for entertainment. Right. Right. (laughs) It was, it was its own era's equivalent of, you know, um, of, you know, TV or movies. Right. Yes. Yeah. And, 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 uh, and rock concerts at the same time. Right. Yeah. You know, so I love the fact that he tried to, he tried to get, you know, at Oxford, he tries to kind of get the students who are there expecting some, another stodgy class on Beowulf scholarship, getting them away from that into feeling like what it must have actually been like to hear this thing in the first place, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So. And that I think would probably really increase their appreciation of it. Oh, I'm sure. Um, You know, I mean, like, and what a treat (laughs) for them, you know, I mean, to be to be transported in that way, you know, mm-hmm. um, like one of the, didn't one of the students say something like they felt like they were there, like yeah. that they were like, you know, part of, part of the story, you know? And I think that's exactly what Tolkien does with all of his works is he, you know, he transports you to another, another world, another time. Absolutely. Well, and, and, you can understand too how being so immersed in Beowulf um, probably fueled his imagination for that. You know, that you've got this really epic scale of a of a fairy story, right? A uh, tale, a true tale from the perilous realm, mm-hmm. and how that must have fueled further fueled his imagination and desire 
to want to create something like that of his own. Yes. Right. For people to consume. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for Um, sure. So, uh, Tolkien also worked with a scholar, the scholar E.V. Gordon on a translation of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Uh, he produced a definitive edition in the 1920s. And uh, then there were several others, and I don't really know any about anything about most of these, uh, but he, he produced other academic works such as A Middle English Vocabulary, The Devil's Coach Horses, An, An Crane Vise, and Hali uh, Maithad, probably butchered that yep, Ziglvara Land and Chaucer as a philologist hmm. so uh, and it should also uh, be noted that he had he did have some some poems published on a small scale during this time oh, so okay yeah cool. so I mean he was very active you know in this 1920s early 1930s period right yeah. Uh, yeah. it was by no means a dark age for him in fact it was it was probably you know it's clear that he really <laughs> I mean he, he really hit the ground running with yeah. his academic career yeah. You know, yeah, he didn't waste time. He didn't loaf. He didn't, he didn't loaf uh, at all. He, he was hasty, actually. He, he seems to have been Unlike quite hasty. Tree beard. Yep. That's right. Um, it's also during this period that he, of course, struck up a friendship with C.S. Lewis. They first met in May 1926 during a faculty meeting at Merton College. And it seems that it... And, and Merton College, again, is, is part of Oxford. It's part of the Oxford University system. It's all very confusing to me as a, as a Yank... <laughs> <laughs> all right. I don't, <laughs> I've always been confused by all the different college names they have, but it's all a part of Oxford, yeah. uh, but Merton college, part of Oxford. And, um, it seems that it took them time to warm to each other. Uh, they were, they were kind of maybe a little suspicious of one another at first. <laughs> um, maybe they saw each other's competition. Probably. Yeah. They're, they're, I'm sure there was some, mm-hmm. some degree of that. Right. Yeah. And, and I can know this from my own life too. There, I can think back, I have had friendships like that where, you know, maybe even for a few years, you know, somebody, but you don't really have a like any reason to be friends with them. And then all of a sudden, like you find something in common and you become best buds, right? Yeah. Or you become best pals, right? Yeah. Um, or just, or just close friends. Right. And, uh, and it's, that's I don't know, beautiful how that happens, but, um, it does seem that it took them some time to warm to each other. I'm again, going to read a little bit from Carpenter about, uh, you know, about that process and what that looked like. So how did it begin? Perhaps northernness was the shared insight that started it. Since early adolescence, Lewis had been captivated by Norse mythology, and when he, when he found in Tolkien another who delighted in the mysteries of the Edda and the complexities of the Volsung legend, it was clear that they, would have, that they would have a lot to share. They began to meet regularly in Lewis's rooms in Maudlin, sometimes sitting far into the night while they talked of the gods and giants of Asgard, or, or discuss the politics of the English school. They also commented on each other's poetry. Tolkien lent Lewis the typescript of his long poem, The Jest of Baron and Luthien. And after reading it, Lewis wrote to him, I could quite honestly say that it is ages since I have had an evening of such delight, and the personal interest of reading a friend's work had very little to do with it. I should have enjoyed it just as well if I'd picked it up in a bookshop by an unknown author. He sent Tolkien detailed criticisms of the poem, which he jestingly couched in the form of a mock textual criticism, complete with the names of fictitious scholars, such as Pumpernickel, Peabody, and, and Schick, who suggested that weak lines in Tolkien's poem were simply the result of scribal inaccuracies in the manuscript and could not be the authentic work of the original poet. Tolkien was amused by this, but he accepted few of Lewis's suggestions, suggested emendations. On the other hand, he did write, rewrite almost every passage that Lewis had criticized, Rewrote so extensively, in fact, that the revised Jest of Baron and Luthien was scarcely the same poem. Lewis soon discovered this to be characteristic of his old friend, of his friend. He has only two reactions to criticism, he remarked. Either he begins the whole work over again from the beginning, or else takes no notice at all. By this time, the end of 1929, Lewis was supporting Tolkien's plans for changes within the English school. The two men intrigued and discussed. Lewis wrote conspiratorially to Tolkien. Forgive me if I remind you that there are disguised orcs behind every tree. Together they waged a skillful campaign, and it was partly thanks to Lewis's support on the faculty board that Tolkien managed to get his reform syllabus accepted in 1931. In Surprise by Joy, Lewis wrote that friendship with Tolkien marked the breakdown of two old prejudices. At my first coming into the world, I had been implicitly warned never to trust a papist, and at my first coming into the English faculty explicitly, never to trust a philologist. 
Tolkien was both. Soon after the second prejudice had been overcome, the friendship moved into the area of the first. So, um, you know, that's kind of a, that, that's a really good account of the process of Lewis and Tolkien becoming, uh, becoming good friends. And of course, it was in 1931 that Tolkien and Lewis, Lewis's friendship began to turn towards the subject of Christianity, which we have explored in our episodes on Mythopoeia and, uh, and of course, when we did our, um, our crossover episode with Pints with Jack. Suffice to say, Tolkien played a critical role in Lewis's conversion to Christianity, which, given Lewis's stature and influence in modern Christianity, would leave Tolkien a very notable individual in and of itself, right? I mean, just the role that he played in seeing Lewis convert to Christianity, right. and aiding Lewis's conversion to Christianity, and then Lewis subsequently playing, I mean, just the incredible role uh, that he has played ever since, you know, he began, you know, he began writing on the subject of Christianity. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't have, you don't have Tolkien, you don't have Chronicles of Narnia. Right. Right. Well, you, you don't, not only that, but you just don't have any of like mere Christianity or right. any of these like highly famous works, highly influential works, mm-hmm. right? The Great Divorce. I mean, how many people just, you know, you just think of how many people have become Christians because, because of, of C.S. Lewis's writing. Lewis's writing. Yeah. How many people have become stronger Christians because of C.S. Mm-hmm. Lewis's writing? Mm-hmm. Um, how many people have, you know, reverted to Christianity? <laughs> you know, so you, I mean, yep. the list just goes on and on. Right. So, and, and given the, the pivotal role that Tolkien played in that process of Lewis himself becoming a Christian, that's my point is that that in and of itself would have made Tolkien a historically significant figure outside of just ac- the academic world, right? Yeah, um, definitely. Even if Tolkien had never wrote The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, he still would have been an important player in the life story of C.S. Lewis. Yes, right? absolutely. So, yeah. um, of course, you know, the, the same could be said probably of Lewis and the fact that he had such an influence on Tolkien and probably the development of Middle Earth and yeah. The Hobbit and then Lord of the Rings. And of course, we'll get into some of that a on, mutually beneficial on the next, relationship. Uh, on, the nice, on the next Life of J.R.R. Tolkien episode. Um, their friendship, of course, famously led to the formation of the Inklings as well. And we'll probably cover the history of the Inklings at some point in the not too distant future. Finally, all during this time, Tolkien held the secret of Middle Earth close to his chest. Uh, it does mention, of course, that he, sh- he shared some things with, you know, a few a few close friends and confidants. Uh, C.S. Lewis, he shared the story of Baron and Luthien, the, which, you know, the poetic form at that time. Um, it all goes back to 1917 when he began the Book of Lost Tales, starting with the fall of Gondolin. He had been working on the Legendarium since before this, but the Book of Lost Tales provides something like a definitive marker where it all started to take some primordial shape. And again, just going to read a little bit from Carpenter because I liked his account of, you know, why Tolkien began this process in 1917. The idea had its origins in his taste for inventing languages. He had discovered that to carry out such inventions to any degree of complexity, he must create for the languages a history in which they could develop. Already in the early Yarindel poems, he had begun to sketch something of that history. Now he wanted to record it in full. There was another force at work, his desire to express his most profound feelings in poetry, a desire that owed its origin to the inspiration of the TCBS. His first verses had been unremarkable, as immature as the raw idealism of the four young men. But they were the first steps towards the great prose poem, for though in prose it is a poetic work, that he now began to write. And then there was a third element playing a part, his desire to create a mythology for England. He had hinted at this during his undergraduate days when he wrote of the Finnish Kalevala. I would that we had more of it left, something of the same sort that belonged to the English. This idea grew until it reached grand proportions. Here is how Tolkien expressed it when recollecting it many years later. Do not laugh, but once upon a time, my crest has long since fallen, I had a mind to make a body of more or less connected legend, ranging from the large and cosmogonic to the level of romantic fairy story. The larger founded on the lesser in contact with the earth, the lesser drawing splendor from the vast backcloths, which I could dedicate simply to England, to my country. It should possess the tone and quality that I desired, somewhat cool and clear, be redolent of our air, the clime and soil of the Northwest, meaning Britain and the hither parts of Europe, not Italy or the Aegean, still less the East, and while some possessing, if I could achieve it, the fair elusive Uh, and while possessing, if I could achieve it, the fair elusive beauty that some call Celtic, though it is rarely found in genuine ancient Celtic things, 
It should be high, purged of the gross, and fit for the more adult mind of a land long steeped in poetry. I would draw some of the great tales in fullness and leave many only placed in the scheme and sketched. The cycle should be linked to a majestic whole, and yet leave scope for other minds and hands, wielding paint and music and drama. Absurd. So, um, you know, that's that's kind of where Middle Earth began, right? Where the composing of the Legendarium began in the uh, all the way back as far as 1917 and even before that, and then he continued working on that throughout the 1920s and into the 30s. And then, of course... It was in the early 30s that the pivotal inspiration hit. Tolkien, bored with grading papers, randomly wrote on a blank sheet of paper, in a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. And that's where we'll leave off for now. Okay, okay. Right on. That was good. Learn anything interesting, Greta? Uh, Yeah, I learned lots of interesting things. All right. Yeah. Good. I didn't know that he worked on the Oxford English Dictionary. That's cool. Yeah. I like to know that, I I like that his letter was W. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's cool. cool I letter. mean, it's better than, uh, I don't know, P. Y. It's better than P. Better than P? For sure. <laughs> better than P for sure. Because you turn W upside down, you have M. It's just a cool letter. <laughs> That's a reason, because if you turn it upside down, <laughs> it's an M. <laughs> it's one of my reasons. All right. Yeah, as you guys, there's a, really, there's a lot of really cool, cool uh, words that start with W. Like walrus. Walrus. That's right. If he had never done that, then we might have never had I am the walrus. That's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I'm not even kidding. Probably. That's probably how it would have worked. I'm sure. Direct connection there. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. No, but in all seriousness, um, that, that that was really good. I hope our listeners learned new things. I can't imagine they didn't. Because I think that was a very thorough exploration of of Tolkien's midlife. Keep on praising. Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm done now. <laughs> All right. You can continue. Um, I just feel like you talked a lot on that episode, so I'm trying to get my words in. I know, I did. So I'm trying to allow you to get your words and in. And I am. I'm getting my words in. Good. I've gotten my words in. Right on. Yeah. Are we going to do correspondence now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Cool. We're going to do correspondence. Let's do it. All right. Uh, a little bit. So we we had a we had a lot of feedback from our Tolkien and Religion episode, and I'm I'm actually going to save that. I think I think we're going to do that next week when we talk about we're going to talk about Project Northmore, and then we're going to just talk about feedback from the Lord of the Rings and Religion episode. Okay. Um. Uh, I, I wanted to share a couple of quick little things. Um, first, just a nice note from one of our patrons, Riff M. And Riff said, where's that note here? He didn't say, where's that note here? That's me <laughs> saying that. Here, here we go. He said, thank you both for brightening up my day with each new podcast. Oh, awesome. Thank you, Riff. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for brightening up our day with a note saying that we brighten up your day. There we go. Mutually Mm -hmm. beneficial relationship. Mutually beneficial. That's what I'm Mm -hmm. talking about. All right. And then we had a note from David of Pines, from Pines with Jack. David. And of course, last time we asked him for help on pronouncing a couple of English place names. He said, not bad pronunciation. Uh, It's Evesham. I think I may have said Evesham or Evesham, Mm. but it's Evesham and Worcestershire. Worcestershire. I thought it was Worcestershire. Well, I, Worcestershire I, sauce. <laughs> Worcestershire sauce. Worcestershire sauce. Um, yeah, so uh, Worcestershire. 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 Dang, say that three times fast. That's impossible. That, that, that. that, 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 that. Uh, yeah, that's not what I meant. Worcestershire. I can't, I can't even say it slowly <laughs> once. <laughs> Worcestershire. Worcestershire. Evesham and Worcestershire. Evesham. Okay. Thank you, David. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it. And then I just do want to share real quick. I, I won't. I'm not going to read the the note, but we got a um, we did get a response from uh, the individual who left the review in the comment for our episode, and that was the the uh, catalyst for us doing the episode on Lord of the Rings and religion. And um, I just have to say, it was it it was the most like humble. Uh, like just just kind note that, that this individual wrote and um you know we're, we're going to try to continue correspondence 
uh, with them, but uh, I was just really moved by it. And um, you know, he he basically said thanks. I had no idea about the, that, that that Tolkien's religion was so influential, uh, you know, in in his works. And um, you know, sometimes it, it sometimes when you've been doing something for a long time and you really immersed yourself in getting to know it you develop the curse of knowledge where you forget that not everybody knows what you know. Right. Right. And I'll say yes. that that happens to me all the time. Right. When I'm prepping for episodes, I'm like, Oh, everybody already knows this though. Am I mm-hmm. just like, you know, um, am I just saying a bunch of stuff that people already know out there? And, and I know some people, you know, there's definitely some people who listen that know far more about Tolkien than I do. But, um, you know, it's probably true that most don't. And that's why they're listening to a podcast about Tolkien. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I just want to say thanks to uh, thanks to Ettinger and um, and for writing us and and just saying thanks for doing the episode. Um, I'm glad that you appreciated it, and I'm glad we struck up a correspondence. And so, um, cool how that worked. That is really cool. Yeah, yeah. and I'm really grateful to uh, to Ettinger for giving us the the uh, opportunity to you know, and maybe even the like the uh, inspiration to talk about to talk about Tolkien and how his religion influenced his works. Yeah. Cuz I think it was a I mean I think I think it was really good and I don't know that we would have done it otherwise. I mean maybe at some point, but it was just really nice that that Andrew opened the door for us there. It was good to have a reason just to go directly at it and I do yeah. um I've been planning on some of the stuff we're going to be doing as far as continuing to look at other especially other controversies when it comes to um, Tolkien and his relationship to like the occult and to uh, paganism and um, and just things where actually the reverse has happened where Christians have you know Christian readers have said oh well see Tolkien's works are unacceptable in this regard because you know he's got the Valar in there and they're obviously gods and you know that's uh, incompatible with you know with a Christian Christian worldview and so you know we're gonna be looking at we're gonna be looking at those topics looking at those episode uh, you know, on future episodes. And, um, and I'm glad that, you know, this gave us a reason to start diving yeah. into that topic headlong. Yeah, so absolutely. And, um, I, you know, I too just want to say to editor, thank you for your, your very honest, humble response. I mean, I think that's, I mean, I think that's really awesome. As do I, as yep. do I. All right. Well, we'd love to hear from you. Tolkien road podcast at gmail.com through the website, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera. All right. That's it for this episode. It's on a wrap. That is a wrap. It's a wrap. All right, peeps. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening. Thanks especially to our patrons. We want to give a shout out especially to the following patrons. Shannon S. Brian O. Emilio P. Zeke F. James A. James L. Chris L. Chuck F. Asia V. Ish of the Hammer. Teresa C. David of Pints with Jack. Jonathan D. Eric S. Joey S. Eric B. Caitlin of Tea with Tolkien. Matt L. Johanna T. Ms. Anonymous. And Sam N. Thank y'all. Thank you all for listening, and we will talk at you next time. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.